Day Trading Radio presents a Bright Eye Trading production. So good evening traders. Welcome to Bry Guy's Tools of the Trade show here on daytradingradio.com. It's currently April 30th, 2013, and we have one of the more interesting interviews uh, coming up for you tonight. Uh, interesting for for the shows that I've been doing. And I uh, love having different guests on, and we look forward to having with us uh, tonight uh, the author, historian, market analyst, father, husband, and that is Mr. Jeffrey Hirsch. So we'll be uh, reaching out to him in uh, just a little while. As you may know, Mr. Hirsch is associated with the Stock Traders Almanac, a publication that was originally a brainchild of his father's back in the late 60s. And what you may not know is that the Alman Almanac is responsible for some of the phrases that we use very commonly today in trading such as the Santa Claus rally did you know that was a stock trader almanac uh, brainchild or catchphrase the Santa Claus rally and then there's the January barometer um, and then they developed something called the best six months strategy and that's what we call sell in May and go away. It kind of grew into that concept. Um, and another final concept is the four-year presidential election cycle. So all different kinds of uh, interesting things that they've come up with. That's not even a complete list, obviously. Uh, but a lot more to come from the folks there at Stock Traders Almanac. So we'll get a chance to talk to Mr. Hirsch about the publication and uh, some of the things that are in it, how we can use it as a tool of the trade, how we can benefit from it. And then we also have some uh, questions that have come in from some of our viewers, some of our members here in the trade room. And I gave you guys my email address in the announcement earlier today and asked you to just um, feel free to send me an email with any of the any of the uh, questions that you might have for our viewer. Let me just bring up my emails here make sure I got that up and ready to go. I got a quote on the screen here that I found. It's from John Templeton. I think it is uh, apropos to the subject matter at hand. The four most dangerous words in investing are this time it's different. How many times have you said that to yourself? Maybe you're just simply trading a, a particular strategy. You've got your moving averages. You've got your indices. And then you tell yourself, even though the market is it's moving up and you're short, or, or that stock is anyway, and you tell yourself, well, this time it's different. This time it's going to bounce off of that line there and come back down. It's not going to keep going up. This time it will not break through those moving averages. This time the stochastics won't get embedded because this time it's different. Well, you know, sometimes sometimes it is different. <laughs> I see some of the members out there agreeing with me here. Sometimes it is different. Sometimes the market will do something that you're not expecting. And uh, that's that's a whole other thing. But as traders, we are about the odds, right? So it's not about being right or being wrong as much as it's about the probability of being right or being wrong. And you could have the probability of being right more often than you're wrong. 
And if you could do that, then you can make a successful living in trading. Now I want to show you a chart here. I'm going to try to bring it over to the other screen. And it's a very large chart off of uh, Seeking Alpha. And what I'll do is I'll share it out to our our members in the room there. Uh, let me see if I were to do... Well, I guess I really can't slide that off the top of the screen. It'll make it a little harder to actually view it. So let me just, I'll zoom in as, as best I can to the content of the of the picture. And uh, I'll share it out to you folks in the room there. You can take a look. And this is uh, an interesting chart someone put together showing roughly the last 10, 15 years. It's actually if, uh, a toss chart, but you can draw this in any one of your your chart programs. It's a weekly chart on the S&P uh, cash market and it goes back to 1997-96 or so and as you can see there it gives you the uh, breakdown according to two different cycles. One is the congressional election and two is the presidential election. So you'll see that at the top there and I'll read to you the author, um, the author's comments as far as what the information means, and uh, see what you think about it here. So first of all, um, the congressional election cycles is displayed in alternate yellow and aqua blue vectors. Now I'm not exactly sure what the alternating. Okay, so that's actually the lines here. Because, you know, I was reading this earlier today, and I still couldn't understand a lot of it. But anyway, so here's here's the beginning point, okay? you got the congressional cycle above here, May 98. And you've got the yellow line that runs up to May 2000. And the blue line that runs down to May 2002. So every two years, he's drawn this as a yellow line and a blue line, a yellow line, a blue line, etc. Number two. Uh, these alternating color vectors will help discern every two years along the chart from the first trading week of May more clearly. So that's why he did it like that. Next, in solid green are correlate dates of the weekly price bars indicating the beginning of the sell-off on the first trading week in May for the referenced cycle years. So what we're looking at then are these green numbers here. So they're the May dates, the beginning of these trends. You've got May 4th, 1998. Up here you have May 1st, 2000. Down here you have May 6th, 2002, etc., etc. So digest that a little bit. Then we have, in solid red, are the correlate dates of the weekly bars completing the sell-off sum at that time. Okay, so that's these red bars here underneath run from the May date to the August date. In this example, talking about that being the, the sell-off window from May to August. So from May down to the pullback, the low in August. That's this dark red line. If you can see that that's drawn in there in each case. Here's the one in 2002. A small one here in 2004, 2006. Back, by the way, back here in 2000, interesting, was the only time when it's above the other swings. All right, moving on. The horizontal solid pink line, which is over here from May 2008 over to May 2012, or I shouldn't say that. It looks like it's the beginning of 2011. No, no, it's the end of 2011. Okay, there it is. May of 2012. This article is dated May of 2012, by the way, so keep that in mind. So that pink line illustrates how the SPX achieved near-perfect correlate price level in May four years earlier on a weekly closing price basis. So kind of pointing out that 
it's it, not exactly a double top you'd call this obviously with the higher prices in here but in a sense you've got this uh, double tap of the of this price level which is roughly 1425 on the S&P cash market okay so that's um, what's mentioned there this is often referred to as a resistance price level vector now obviously from where we are today going into 2013 we've moved past this I didn't get an opportunity to redraw this and um, and uh, looks like our guest is just about ready to go here so I will take care of that in just a minute um, but finishing this up so obviously we went past this point in 2013 and then of course hit our double top for this point back here in uh, 2007 uh, just finishing up real quick the legend the dotted green lines so that's down below these dashed green lines uh, represent some key eight-year price vectors and ascending price channels that have that have been identified uh, and of course eight-year marks would correspond to the presidential election cycles and then finally take note of the magnitude of the sell-offs from number one the first week in May of a regime change cycle election year so these also labeled regime changes here's 2000 with the President Bush uh, 43 and then regime change here with President Obama and then of course over here was a question mark like I said this was the May 2012 is when the article was written so didn't know that it was uh, so in this case not a regime change and as measured from its preceding year's price level high in the summer so that's what they did is go to the previous year's summertime and draw to the next previous year's summertime to the next previous year's summertime etc etc okay so chew on that a little while I sent you the link in the room there so you guys can play around with that and enjoy that a little bit and just got disconnected from the room here. Hold on a second. I am still on the air, I hope. Just double checking a couple things. Figure out why I'm not. Uh... Okay. So, let's uh, real quick, I'm just going to queue up a song for Mr. Hirsch as requested. And we'll come up on the other side and uh, give him a buzz and get the rest of the interview going. Thanks for listening to Bright Guy's Tools of the Trade here on DayTradingRadio.com. Jeffrey Hirsch is Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing and Sales Officer of Time Warner Cable. Oh, wait a minute. That's, that's not the right guy. Hold on a second. Okay. Oh, here it is. In the late 1960s, Yell Hirsch finalized his... I'm not his... hearing this in here. Oh, he's not hearing it. Oh, you know why he's not hearing it? Because I muted it, so he wasn't talking over the show. That's what happened. So, bear with me, and I will turn that back on. How about now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Breaker 1-9. So, you're not with uh, Time Warner Cable. No, I have... Um, Jeffrey A. Hirsch. Time Warner Cable. What are you talking about? <laughs> All right, hang on just for a second. In the late 1960s, Yale Hirsch finalized this concept of the Stock Traders Almanac. Curiously, our guest tonight arrived soon thereafter. Joining the firm in 1990, Jeff Hirsch worked under his father's leadership and mentorship until taking over as editor-in-chief in and around 2001. With over 20 books to his credit, Mr. Hirsch is currently editor-in-chief of the Almanac Investor Newsletter, Stock Traders Almanac, StockTradersAlmanac.com and the Hirsch Organization. He's also Chief Market Strategist for Magnet AE Management, an asset management firm that manages the Magnet AE Fund. Please welcome author, market analyst, and historian, Mr. Jeffrey Hirsch. Good evening, Mr. Hirsch. Thanks for having me, Brian. Um, uh, thank you for being on the show. Appreciate it. And uh, I hope the uh, intro was uneventful. Uh, everything is just peachy, very seasonally appropriate today. Okay, very good to hear. Uh, well, I know your time is limited, so um, we'll get right to it. Now, the the book is something of interest to me because um, 
you know, ever since being a member here on the on daytradingradio.com, um, it's where I became familiar with your book. But obviously, it goes back much longer than that. And uh, I'm just doing the math here and wondering if uh, you or the book are older. Um, I mean, if you go by the actual uh, publication date, I've got a about a year or so on the book, but the incorporation of the Hirsch organization was February of 66 when I was still cooking. Ah. My birth date is May 26. Um, don't mind that. That's your rock star back there kicking things over. Um, <laughs> so, the, uh, um, so I was born, uh, bred, weaned, raised on the whole thing. The first edition, the 1968 edition, came out in the fall of 67. So I was already one year, one year old, one years old, one year old. But um, <clears throat> conveniently, uh, on my birthday every year is when we hand in, or just before, I, I, I end up having a birthday around Memorial Day weekend, uh, which is uh, uh, festive. But uh, I'll be putting the 47th edition of the Stock Traders Almanac uh, to bed, sending it off to press, as we say, um, just prior to my 47th birthday, so it's easier for me to keep track. Very cool, very cool. So how did your dad come up with this idea? What was the um, intention? Well, um, being blessed with a, a large cranium and a um, sort of uh, particular mind, uh, he was working with his older cousin, my cousin also, my father, uh, my, my godfather, uh, Samson Coslow, um, at a service called Indicator Digest, which I'm not sure if how many of you guys know what that is or was. It was a proving ground for um, analysts, newsletter writers, and the, and the like out of Palisades Park, New Jersey. Hmm. And my father was working with Sam. He was, Sam was in the show, in show business. He wrote Cocktails for Two, My Old Flame, produced Global Cabana amongst other things. Um, fond memories as a child at his uh, fancy houses. But um, uh, Sam ran an ad. He, after he sold his stock, uh, sold his company, published him to RCA back in the 20s for stock, and he lost it in the crash. He became a student of the market, uh, the 29 crash, that is, and ended up doing a book called uh, Super Yields um, and compiled all these indicators. Um, and did an old... Uh, AB Split Ad and Barron's, where they had two presses, and you're on one headline and one press, another headline and another press, and, and you test which one works. And he, the ad was a success, and he started this business, Indicator Digest, and called my father in to uh, be his chief operating officer and run the operations. So that was about 61, I believe. Um, after working with all these indicators for excuse me, several years, Yale um, had the epiphany to compile them all in calendar order for his own personal use so that he could track them throughout the year as they came around on the guitar. Uh, and basically the almanac was Yale's workbook, and um, it caught on. I mean, he did have some uh, marketing and sales effort the first year or so, but um, you know, aside from the guy going around all the brokerage firms, which is where the, a lot of the initial sales and over the years a lot of the sales were... Um, the holiday gift from the broker to the client was where we did a lot of business. And uh, over the years, I ended up working in the mailroom, packing, shipping, filling orders. Um, Monday Night Football was my shipping night. I'd come in and, and <laughs> fill invoices from the ladies, as we called them back in the day, when the office was uh, out of the converted garage the, you know, at the house. Right. Um, and then I'd load up the UPS truck and... Um, then over the years, uh, I ran some numbers for Yale. We used to do the, uh, you guys see a lot of the, the, the daily um, performance numbers, the market probability statistics, the uh, half-hourly data, the um, days of the week. In the Almanac, we used to go through the printed barons with a ruler and a red pen and underline each half-hour tick and each day close of what was up from the previous um, number and then run it on an adding machine and put it in a paper spreadsheet. Hmm. So when I came in <clears throat> in the 90s, early in 1990, you know, uh, uh, full-time official, um, I think it was 92 when I got into, I think it was uh, Excel for DOS originally, not being, you know, the, the most, um, uh, you know, 
well-versed computer person, but I converted all that stuff into Excel spreadsheets, and over the years, it's now evolved into SQL Server Visual Basic software that we have internally. So not Lotus 1, 2, 3? No, I'm, uh, I've been a Microsoft um, you know, uh, uh, fan and user for my entire uh, professional career, really. I mean, I do use some other things, but, uh, sure, sure. but it, was, it was Excel. Very cool. So how is the, um, you know, you mentioned this has become a gift amongst traders, but how did they at first react to a book like this? I mean, there's always a, a, a reticence to look at something like this as being valuable. I, my understanding, and granted I was a wee lad at the time, was there was never any reticence. It was well accepted. Uh, anyone who doesn't <clears throat> subscribe or believe in cycles and patterns and market history repeating still uh, and then and still doesn't want anything to do with it but um, there was other work that was done before then I mean I, I've been talking about the January effect over the years and I did some research for an article that I did and um, I found out that this uh, January effect was first detailed and outlined by a, a investment banker and analyst in 1942 or 41 named Sidney Wachtell who did a paper for the Journal of Finance, University of Chicago Press thing, and and you know, so it wasn't a new thing. It was just the fact that um, Yale was able to encapsulate and uh, uh, amalgamate and and bring together all the different indicators related to the stock market um, in this wonderful book that we still use. I mean, granted, it's it's a little bit um, antiquated for today's digital uh, world but I don't know for me I still write a lot of things down and next to the computer keep a pen in the almanac you make notes in there I'm right. um, looking here at Johnny's studio and there's notes and and, and uh, all kinds of handwritten stuff there so it's it still has its its purpose and you know I find I remember things better when I write them down and here and his almanacs right here too even if I can't read my own handwriting writing it down it takes it to memory a lot better than just typing it in yeah well, make sure you autograph a copy for him while you're there. Johnny's got to work. <laughs> so, um, what about you mentioned about just going in the barrens and and marking everything down day by day, keeping track on paper, and then of course with the electronic spreadsheet. How do you uh, how do you guys in your in your group there uh, respond to the software that has enabled charting to allow you to go back in time and and do some of this analysis a little bit more quickly? Um, we, we subscribe to it, we use it. I am always, um, and I, I think I get this from my father, uh, a little bit dubious of, of anyone's data. The database that we have, granted it's not every inch a day tick, I cross-checked it between three different databases. So the closing um, price data in our database is about as accurate as it gets. I know that doesn't necessarily matter for day trading, um, I don't necessarily do that myself, but I, I will use the intraday activity to get in and out of things. But we use it, and um, we I'll still fall back on my own data and run an Excel chart uh, just to keep it simple and clear and less noise. But I use, uh, I mean, I'm using uh, a Trade Navigator right now. We have an arrangement with them, so I like their software. They have some great historical seasonal stuff, um, so we'll we'll use their their seasonal trend on the bottom of the chart, but, um, you know, you got to use it all. Uh, I continue to use our historical database in conjunction with the modern, you know, software that we have at, at our disposal. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot of traders that um, use different, even different trading software. Uh, you know, they have a favorite. Most everyone has a favorite, but I almost feel like you have to have a backup. You can't just uh, lock yourself into one thing if you're intending to do this for a living. Yeah, and I think the one thing about the almanac with that is I find I'm looking for um, particular information. Like if you want to know the low, the bear market bottom, uh, for every single bear market back to 1900, you're not going to find that easily in one of the modern charts. You're going to go to the page in the almanac and you're going to see them all there at a glance. All of the annual high lows and closes for any market, uh, you know, for the major equity indices is all right there. Um, I was at a a talk from my partner Jordan uh, down in uh, Gramercy area at the executive forum and 
he was having some fun and just like you know calling out a couple numbers to me while I was sitting there you know um, at the at the table uh, you know looking for the bottom of seventy four and you know, these numbers because of the almanac are sitting there right at the tip of my head so. <laughs> It's kind of fun. It's kind of nice, and um, it's also a little bit of a curse that I have those numbers all flying through my head at the same time. I know what you're saying. Sure. Um, from your your website, it says while the patterns don't repeat with mathematical certitude, they do recur often enough to provide an edge to savvy, disciplined investors. Our commitment to you is to identify the patterns, conduct extensive research to validate the patterns, and to alert you on how to profit as these patterns unfold in today's markets. So is there more involved than just the book? A lot more involved. Um, and a lot of it's uh, technical mathematic uh, in, in, the, in the numbers that we run, but a lot of it is also um, analysis and how you read the data. I mean, we, this is a, you know, a world of human beings uh, trading and, and writing algorithms and, and building high-frequency trading platforms, but there's still people involved. And you still have to be able to discern the patterns and be able to um, either let it ride or cut and run. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do. On the, on the website we put out, I mean, today um, we've combined our uh, partner's stock selection process. Uh, Magnet is, is the acronym, and Jordan Kimmel's um, the guy we're, we're uh, teamed up with for running money. But um, what we found is that... Uh, Going long, his system's top rank stocks during the best six months after we get our MACD buy signal in October, November, and then going short his worst ranking stocks when we get our sell signal for sell in May has proved to increase the returns of the um, system and lower the volatility and the drawdowns. And what we've put out today is a list of... Uh, Six stocks, um, two small caps, two mid caps, and two um, large caps that are attractive shorting opportunities. And I'm not going to give them out on the air because it's uh, to our paid subscribers, but people can go and take advantage of the seven day free trial on our website, which is stocktradersalmanac.com, and uh, have at it. And there's some technical. Um, you know, analysis patterns that, that we employ with the, I mean, the, the magnet screen is basically a fundamental um, quantitative screen of 19 different criteria that blends value, growth, and momentum. And we take the top or bottom rank and uh, then drill down and look at what the charts look like. We're not going to go shorting a, you know, micro cap penny stock that hasn't, that's not in a downtrend. We're going <laughs> to look at stocks that have you know, some liquidity that are already breaking down. I'm not going to go pick a top there. I want something that's, you know, uh, 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 like the old uh, the old deer in the herd or the injured little, you know, whatever. Uh, you, you want you want to take the low-hanging fruit there and um, either short failure at um, resistance with um, increased volume and some technical confirmation from stochastics, MACD, relative strength, whatever, or if it breaks through support, on big volume uh, with some similar technical confirmation, that's when you um, you know want to want to want to jump on those and, and sell those short. Okay, so now let's talk about this sell in May concept. Uh, from what I was reading it originally from you, from you guys, you called it the best six month strategy. Um, I the don't know six month switching strategy. Switching strategy. Okay, and so that would be for the months before. May and the months after May, I'm assuming. Um, the best six months switching strategy was created, discovered, built by uh, the aforementioned Yale Hirsch, my father, in 1986. Um, we have been carrying in the almanac, if you turn to your prayer book, on page 147. Uh, Let's see. Is that correct? Am I? Yes, 147. You'll see the um, S&P 500 monthly percent performance bar chart. Very simple, average monthly performance of the 12 months of the year. You'll see November, December, January, March, and April standing above the other months. February is a little bit of weak link, and you see weakness from May through September. July has had some 
uh, improvement recently, so was October, but they're still down there. So that's where he saw that, hey, not only are there three consecutive uh, great months, November, December, January, <clears throat> but also if you tack on, uh, you know, the next three, you have this wonderful pattern that we found where most of the market's gains <coughs> excuse me, are made from November to April. Flip over to page 48 and you'll see the numbers where the Dow averages and that's just a you know basic big uh, uh, um, easy long-term benchmark to look at. Dow average about 7.3 percent during the best months November through April about 0.3 uh, percent um, made through October and then you'll see the ten thousand dollars that we put in in 1950 hypothetically and compound to adding no new money turns in about six hundred seventy five thousand if my memory is correct there Brian you can tell me if I'm not I'm not looking and a loss of about a thousand twenty four dollars that's uh, changed a little bit and got a little bit better we add the MACD trigger wrinkle and on the buy side of the MACD we use um, 8179, which is something a lot of people don't use so much anymore, but that comes out of Jerry Appel's original research, the guy who created MACD. Uh, <clears throat> because there's a little bit of a faster um, indicator, we all know that bottoms are more of an event and occur a little bit more quickly than tops, more of a process. And um, we use the 12269 on the, on, the, on, the, on the sell side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, over the years, uh, what you know, Yale did was pretty much just talk about that, and what we've done over the last several years is really build on that, and you know, proudly standing on his shoulders, riding his coattails, and we've converted it, and um, I guess evolved it to something that's a little bit more dynamic and a little bit more um, active. We don't sell in May and go away. We don't go away. Uh, we get more defensive, and I've been, we've been writing about this, uh, maybe perhaps ad nauseum for the past month. Mm -hmm. We've had our sell signal since April 1st when the MACD sell 12.69 came in negative, stayed negative. We made a little bit of a subjective call on that. Some years it's on the cusp of going back the other way. We'll wait it out and look for some more confirmation. This year we pulled the trigger. Um, still pretty close to the highs, uh, a couple percent away. But um, we'll limit new buying almost uh, not initiate any new long stock positions. Um, we'll tighten up our stops. Uh, we'll get out of um, any of the uh, broad-based um, stock market index ETFs or sectors that we're trading. We actually got whipsawed a little bit back in November. Our signal was November 6th, I believe. Um, we, the Dow, the diamonds uh, held on. Um, if you look back, uh, that the, the prices have been adjusted for dividends, so it looks like the, the Dow of the Diamonds may have hit our stop loss, but it didn't. We got stopped out of the NASDAQ and the S&P, never got back into those. In that, you know, hypothetical newsletter portfolio, we'll close out those positions and get the sell signal, tighten up our stops, and uh, also a lot of the other sector ETF positions, whether it's, um, you know, oil or consumers or w whatever the different... Uh, or tech, the different ETFs that we picked up for the stock sector seasonalities, which are a little bit different, but most of them occur from September, October through March, April, May. Um, and then we'll pick up some bond positions for defense because bonds are inversely correlated to stocks, and they've also been shown with um, our Commodity Traders Almanac with my uh, co-author, John Person, who I assume a bunch of you know, who's um, a brilliant resource for me. Learn a lot from him. I like his pivots. His pivots, I use them every day. Uh, he also taught me what a, what a high close and a low close doji were. Um, so, uh, and I've seen him trade live. Uh, it, it's impressive. But um, we confirmed the uh, bond seasonality does go uh, inverse to stocks. And, you know, the two that we like right here is, um, uh, you know, with the IEF. The seven to ten year I share I shares Barclays and the TLT, which is twenty plus year, and there's an interesting ETF that we like that is a professional, um, you know, uh, short trader. This guy John Del Vecchi, who I've met, uh, is um, 
the head, the manager of this ETF Ranger. It's now Ranger Equity Bear. It used to be Active Bear ETF. They changed the name of it, but it's tickers HDGE like hedge. And um, <clears throat> as I said earlier, go short our worst rank stocks. And uh, you know, it's 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 not a go away strategy. It's a prevent D strategy. It's switched bias to the short side and debt and um, really limit new longs in the stock market and tighten up on the on the stops and take some profits and in, in, in positions that have run away that are stalling and cut losses and anything that's not working out so um, whereas in October when we get at like October 11 2011 was a great example I was um, you know one of the lone bulls on the on, on, in the market uh, and that was just a time to go um, full out, you know, long and everything. Again, this November, when we had that, uh, that you know, that turn um, after the election, uh, that was a great time to get really long buy a stock. So that's how we think about the best six months switching. And I only latch on to the sell in May and go away uh, moniker because everyone uses it. So I might as well, um, you know, <laughs> talk. You don't feel like correcting them every time? Yeah, I got, I got tired of it. I hear you. Um, now, we seem to have a couple of different things going on this year. Uh, one is the fact that we're reaching all-time highs on various indices. And number two is having a, uh, it's been a post-election year. And I also wanted to ask you how much having a second-year Democrat, whether that f comes into play. Now, I don't mean to bring politics into it, but I did hear... This guy, and I don't know if it was you or somebody from your organization, but this was like two years ago. And what they said is on a first-year Republican presidency and a second-year Democrat presidency, the market rallies. And they were pointing out, of course, that we were going to have that in this case either way. We were going to have a first-year Republican or a second-year Democrat. So considering all those variables, does any of that fall into some of the historical data that you've seen? I think it does. Um, I'm more uh, focused on the <clears throat> actual four-year cycle um, itself, you know, how the first, second, third, fourth years behave. There has been a, a lot of work, and we have it in this particular post-election year edition, the um, <clears throat> bullish bias of uh, Democratic presidents uh, and Republican Congresses to the market as well as the first year of Democrats being uh, a um, <clears throat> better year because Democrats are usually, by nature of their liberal um, ideologies, a little bit more deliberate and uh, slower to get policy um, initiatives uh, going, whereas Republicans will come in a little more conservative dogma and uh, take action faster, and it tends to... Um, cause the market to be better for Republicans in the midterm year uh, and better for Democrats in the post-election year. Um, I think the real underlying bullish uh, push to this market, it's been said a lot, it's that Bernanke put. Um, the presses have been cranking. I, I think without that, we, we'd be struggling a bit more. My um, calendar is marked with, I'm uh, not sure exactly which day in January 2014 it is, but I'm pretty sure uh, that Bernanke's not going to take another term, whether nominated or otherwise. And that may be the moment at which the um, monetary policy, uh, um, you know, bias shifts. So that's what I'm looking at. It'll be definitely be an excuse to make a change, wouldn't it? Yes, at, at a bare minimum. Yeah. Somebody actually coming in with a, uh, a different... Um, philosophy and mindset and just changing because yeah the, what they say about this committee the chairman runs the show well it definitely seemed to be the case with greenspan mm -hmm. so and more so with bernanke as he's you know uh grown into the job right now i know um we're kind of bumping up to the end of your time here but mm -hmm. um one of the questions from one of the members was uh, what you thought about algo algorithm trading and and their effect on the market. Uh, you know, from a historical perspective, as you've seen things change. Yeah, algo and, and high frequency trading um, doesn't seem to be as 
big of a deal uh, to me, to the market um, patterns and seasonalities as a lot of people want to believe. Um, I, I haven't seen the intraday patterns change all that much. Um, in, in fact, negligibly, since this whole pattern, uh, this this whole um, push of algo and, and HFT has, has been around. I mean, we've been getting rocked by program trading since 87. Um, I think it's noise out there. I think it increases some of the intraday volatility and you know day to day volatility. But overall, um, those algos are still written by humans. Uh, there are still uh, there's still the ghosts and the the human ghosts and the machines there, and it's they they still get turned on and off at you know different times of the day, and um, it hasn't really. I haven't really seen it change anything. Um, I think it's fine. I think it's great. I think it, it, people make money with it. Um, I, I think there's also some issues, and we've seen the flash crash problems with it when those algos go a little haywire when there's not a grown up watching over it. Hmm. So um, they're going to get reeled in. There's been triggers put in the markets uh, ever since the computer trading started um, back in the in the eighties, and um, it's definitely here to stay. But um, it's not an issue that I think is, is uh, impacting the market. It's not something I think you can really game either from an individual standpoint. You know, if you're if you're in one of those you know two sigma type funds and, and you you got all the you know uh, mathematicians and, and all that stuff going, knock yourself out. It, it's not a game I think you need to play to, to make money in the market or to, to to make money trading. Okay. Okay. Well, I. Didn't see a whole lot of other questions come in. Um, I think we kind of, I was able to touch on most, if not all of them. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to bring out from your notes? Um, I, I think I covered most of this, the, the things. I mean, I, I, I want to, um, you know, I think that the one, I think you can look at the blog today and see some of the topping patterns that we've talked about. I mean, I've mentioned this um, uh, three peaks domed house pattern before. It hasn't worked the last few times, but. There's a little mini one showing up there. We've got a sort of sloppy head and shoulders forming uh, potential, you know, one, two, three, you know, re top reversal pattern. Um, so I think with us being so extended at these highs, everyone, I know you guys are, are in cahoots with uh, my buddy Danny Riley over at Mr. Top Step, whom I love and, you know, uh, selling the rips and buying the dips and, and you know, his uh, closing print from the floor is, is always a gas for me and always informative, but... Um, I would suspect that, you know, we are coming to at least a pause in the market. I'm not projecting a major downdraft, um, uh, some form of correction, sideways action. I, I think we've come way too far to not, uh, to not see the S&P and the, you know, the, the major U.S. equity markets and all equities take a little bit of a breather, especially with a rally in the past six months like we've had and coming to the end of the seasonal period. And I know there's a lot of talk about all these bears out there and all this money on the sideline. I don't know. All I hear is bull. I think, I think the bear the bear story is a lot of bull. Um, <laughs> put calls, you know, complacent, frothy, if you will. Uh, investors' intelligence, which has been around longer than I, uh, the bears are less than twenty percent. Combined, the bulls and the correction people are over eighty. So you know, we can torture the statistics to tell us whatever we want if we torture them long enough. So. Um, I, I would definitely bring out the prevent D right now. Okay. And that brings me to my last question. In a fair fight, who wins? You or Danny Riley? Uh, currently right now, at this age? Yes. Me. I did see you in, in, in uh, O'Flanagan's. I know. I know. Uh, I think, you know, in his prime, I would mess with Danny. <laughs> You don't think he was holding back a little? Uh, he's a big boy. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I played rugby with all those big boys for years, so they they, they don't uh, they don't frighten me. Um, but I wouldn't mess with Dandy when he was in his thirties. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> Good stuff. All right, Jeff. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show with us and giving us your insight and sharing with us a little bit about the the history of uh, the book and of the markets as well. And uh, hopefully sometime in the future either myself or Johnny can uh, have you on again I'd love to really enjoyed it okay thanks a lot good luck everyone
Okay, that was Jeff Hirsch here on DayTradingRadio.com with Bry Guys Tools of the Trade. We really appreciate him coming on. And I put a link in the room there for ordering a copy of the Stock Traders Almanac. And as he mentioned, if you want to go to uh, the website, which is StockTradersAlmanac.com, I think I have a link to it. In fact, I have a link to, uh, let's see, today's Tuesday. Well, you can have this one anyway. This is yesterday's uh, blog post. And uh, from there, I'm sure you can get to today's blog post. Um, and that's something that you can take advantage of. And you see it written by Jordan Kimmel. That's his partner over at the Magnet Fund. And uh, you might find that real interesting. And, of course, you can sign up for a subscription on that website as well and get access to some of the information that he just mentioned to you as being uh, uh, some of the stocks that they're looking at at this time. So enjoy that, guys, and um, I hope you find it of some use.